Good afternoon. How are you today? Well, uh, yesterday I was dragging a little bit because I have taken on a new case and there were all sorts of papers to file and readings to be done. And uh, But on the, the Holly front, uh, first of all, it's no pleasure to take a bronchoscopy. And so there was a little pain medication afterwards. There is usually a little bit of blood from the samples they take to uh, see how healthy the lungs are. And uh, the temperature may increase, and it did, and that's always a scare because the increase of the temperature means an infection, usually. But in the case of a bronchoscopy, it may not, and it didn't. So uh, that's just a... A taste of our <laughs> our comings and goings about uh, a lung transplant. So uh, now, despite my cheery self, which surprises me a little bit, I have, I guess, uh, a little intellectual ennui. Um, in that, we just can't seem to get ahead. We just keep screwing things up. It's just amazing to me. Okay, so let's start with a couple of my favorites. Um, and I think the ones that are the important ones in the news. We have the Bragg Grand Jury. And the latest word I heard yesterday, and maybe it's changed because I haven't been able to pay attention much today, was that there wouldn't be any indictment this month. Okay. Uh, now, did they plan one? I don't know. Now, let me tell you how I did complicated grand juries. It's mostly the federal system. When I worked in the state system, there was uh, another attorney who was handling that part of the case. And so I was familiar with it, but he pretty much followed my practice. What is my practice? Thin in the grand jury, as little as possible. And your key witnesses, uh, also as little as possible, or an agent testifies and there is no hearsay objection in the grand jury. And the standard to go forward with an indictment is probable cause, which is probably a little less than more likely than not. And it's not subject to defense, although sometimes assistants, uh, D DAs or U.S. attorneys or whatever, allow the target subject of the grand jury to put a witness before the grand jury. Now, in New York, there is a special problem, which is that if you were to charge somebody with a conspiracy in what they call a substantive count, in other words, conspire to uh, misuse and defraud with two or more people, and a substantive charge having to do with the single violation of the mail code or whatever is involved. And why that is special is that the the district, the, uh, the Supreme Court judge, which is the trial court judge in New York, uh, can look at the grand jury to see if there was different evidence for those two charges. But again, that can be satisfied with probable cause and a few witnesses. You don't actually try the case to the grand jury. And if that's what they're doing, I, I don't understand it. Now, do you lock in some people? Yes. So they can't stray. But... Cohen is so far supportive of this, I can't understand why you put him before the grand jury repeatedly. And then Pecker, a <laughs> good name of the national, well, can't think of an appropriate term, the scandal sheet, the National Enquirer that he ran. Um, you know, I guess he's a witness you'd want to lock in, but he's had a cooperation agreement. So, uh, where's the beef? Now, another problem that comes to mind, given how Trump and his aides are sounding violent and coercive and obstructive, makes me think of how secure is the grand jury? Meaning, what are they doing to secure the grand jury against outside influences. And the longer this thing goes on, the more breathing room you give to misconduct. Now, am I out of line saying that? Years ago, after I did a Senate investigation, the district attorney for the Bronx, Marola, asked me to participate in a prosecution. And it was a former Labor Secretary, 
Donovan and a mobbed up guy named Maselli. And the jury was interfered with during the trial. And then it appeared finally to be hung and they didn't get a verdict. And the question was, should they go forward? And there was a very serious question about investigating and prosecuting interference with that jury. So I'm just saying it can happen, it has happened, it will happen again, and we don't want it to happen in this case. So uh, if they're, I don't know, protecting the record or they've changed their mind and so forth, they may kick themselves in the hindquarters for letting Bob Costello with his BS before the grand jury. So who is in the grand jury? It only takes a majority to go forward. And uh, on this score, there's another thing that really bothers the hell out of me. And when you hear it, jump up and down and write to whoever's saying it on the air and say, you're wrong. And here's, the, here's what's wrong. There's this statement that, oh, he wasn't prosecuted for this problem with Cohen and the, the gals because he was president. Wrong. First of all, that is, in a way, an admission that a president is above the law. Because why shouldn't he be subject to the law while he is president? And do I have any examples? Well, there was a vice president named Spiro Agnew, and he was found to <laughs> bribe people. And he tried to challenge the ability to prosecute him while he was the vice president. And the court said, nah, not at all. Uh, an impeachment or a removal uh, does not have to occur before you can be charged with a crime because a removal is different than a criminal action for a crime you're committing. And so ultimately, Spiro Agnew pleaded guilty, made a deal, and resigned as a vice president. Now, similarly, we have a situation in which Richard Nixon could have been prosecuted. Some thought he should have been prosecuted. He was in office. He was president. And he resigned, having made a deal that his successor, Ford, would grant him a pardon. Now, that was a rotten deal. And back then, people made some of the same arguments you hear now, save the nation. There were reforms. But the, the ink was in the water. His influence over the years has been terrible, and we have never quite cleaned the stench off the White House and the Capitol for how that case was handled. Maybe it would have been better then if we did what we had to. So what is this about the Justice Department saying, oh, we can't prosecute a president while he's in office? Well, <laughs> they've written their own opinion about it, in the Office of Legal Counsel, and don't get me wrong, these are lawyers with fine credentials, except they're misapplied to this question of whether or not a president is above the law by saying he is while he's president. That's ridiculous. He has immunity to do anything? Wrong. Just not right. No matter the statute of limitation? Wrong. No matter how serious the offense? Wrong. No matter that it's a crime? Wrong. So, you should consider the fact that the Watergate Council thought there was no such prohibition. And those people who worked on the Mueller investigation, they had a brief that said the same thing that I'm saying, which is that you can prosecute a sitting president. So what's the big deal? He's not a sitting president now. The big deal is persuading the nation that we are doing the law right. And Consider the fact that the Department of Justice, under Barr, did not fail to prosecute Trump because he was the president at the time. They did everything they could to suppress that prosecution in the Southern District of New York, my old office. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take Berman's word for it, who was the U.S. attorney who was kicked out because he wouldn't listen to Maine Justice and he wouldn't listen to Barr and he wouldn't back off the charges that he appeared he was ready to file given the Cohen indictment and the indication that Trump was involved. But he didn't get that chance because Barr 
had the president fire his ass. <laughs> so when people say, oh, you know, he was president at the time, say bullshit. Just keep saying it. Because when you, <laughs> when you ignore the facts, it has a way of coming back and compromising you down the road. Now, in terms of NUE, what's another thing? Three children shot, killed. Three, about 60-year-olds, shot, killed. One, at least emotionally troubled individual, who, depending on what you can believe, got guns and went and shot up his old school at, and he was the age of 28. And we celebrate the fact that law enforcement got there soon enough to kill him. But that's not the story. The story is not about mental health. The story is not about the grief we have for the lost lives, lives of, uh, of the children and of people who are more senior. The story is that we have these devices that almost anyone can get that are used to kill other people. A 223 caliber bullet sits in an AR-15. It pierces the skin. It's at such a speed it's compressing the body upon impact. And as it builds this up at the speed it travels, it can blow a hole in your back or internally. It can break up nerves. It can break up bones. It will probably kill you. And that weapon has no business in America. And the people who have it and do nothing about it, it's wrong. And the people, for example, uh, earlier today, I looked up ads by Smith & Wesson, and they are talking about violence. Now, when they started back in, I don't know, 2000 and something, oh, they talk about hunting, you know, and they talk about 9 millimeter, which doesn't have the, the punch and effect, destructive effect that, uh, by the way, some might say, uh, impact. Because <laughs> they don't know the word, use the word effect. That it, that it hurts, that it makes a difference, that it can destroy you. Now, so a, a 9 millimeter is pretty serious too, uh, but a 223 caliber bullet going through your body from an AR-15 lights out. Thoughts and prayers, vague promises of reform, and nothing happens. Ennui. Anyway, that's what I feel. So, uh, but I have a resolve that we don't let these clowns off the hook. And it's our clowns and their clowns. You know, come on, Bragg, are you losing the resolve to do this? Are you fainting before the impact of battle? <sighs> Notice I used impact correctly there. <laughs> At least we're going to, well, you're going to agree or disagree with me, but you're going to know where I stand on it. So, what is going to happen? Uh, the nation has to recoil from the normalcy that we're ex accepting that children can be killed and that anyone else can be killed who's innocent in a non-defense situation and that our answer is we go kill the shooter after he's harvested his inventory of death and destruction among innocents. It's just not, it's just not right. So, uh, now, we also learn that Pence has to testify. And some people are excited about that. But if I read the court's decision right, he has to testify. <laughs> Forget this. He doesn't have to testify about what he did on January the 6th. Give me a break. What about on January the 6th, when he was running, properly so, from those, unlike some other people, uh, to be safe? Was that part of his official business? 
Was the invasion of the capital part of his business? Was when they tried to get Pence in a car to go away, to be, quote, safe? Was that part of his business and who that driver was and what they said to him and what he said back? And what about any conversations he had with Trump on January the 6th? Uh, what the hell was the judge thinking when he made, she, I don't know who, what the name of the judge was right now, made the restriction that was made? NUE. So how do we deal with the disappointment and disaffection we have but the people who are supposed to be our friends, and some of you know how I feel about it, our friends in politics will break our hearts because they do the wrong thing. The wrong thing. They don't show courage. They show fear. They show uncertainty. They're not willing to join the battle. And it's a worthy one because it's about our democracy. It's about our value system. And we have people right and left, who don't understand that because they're too busy worrying about their phony baloney job, to quote Mel Brooks. And we can't have that. The job has got to be subservient to the mission, to the requirements.